Hey YouTube, so I wanted to make a really quick video introducing the concept of vector embeddings. Uh, it's a really interesting and, and really simple concept once you kind of break it down. Um, and you know, unless you've been living in a, on a remote island, uh, you've probably heard a lot about generative AI this year. Now, as powerful as these AI systems are, they can be made even more versatile by incorporating external data. And that's where vector stores and embeddings come in. So machine learning algorithms work with numbers. And at their core, vector embeddings are how we translate things like text and images and videos, etc., into numbers that a computer can understand. So we can see here in our example, we have our objects coming, uh, coming into an embedding model, which is how we convert an object into an embedding. And then we see that we have an output, uh, which is a vector embedding, which you can kind of think of uh, as a list of coordinates. Um, so, you know, kind of expanding on the coordinate example, uh, really I like to think of vector embeddings as coordinates represented in a three-dimensional space where the closer that each vector embedding is to one another, the closer they are in similarity. So here we can see a bit of an example uh, of this in, in 2D, and uh, we'll move over to a 3D example here in a moment, but we can see, you know, a sad boy is walking, a little boy is walking, a little boy is running. The distance between these vector points uh, are fairly close. So when you're measuring um, vector distance using, you know, KNN, K nearest neighbor, things like that, um, that's how we're measuring similarity. And uh, so, you know, an obvious use case for these are recommendation engines. If you like this show, then you might like this other show that's closely related. Or maybe in a product recommendation use case where um, if you like this product, uh, then you might also like this product or this podcast with this podcast, etc. So, you know, uh, expanding a little bit more into how vector embeddings are created. So there's a couple different ways to do it. In the past, um, feature engineering was one method where uh, a domain expert might take and quantify various features of an object, you know, shape, color, regions, etc., that capture that object's semantics. Uh, but this isn't really a, a scalable process. It's very laborious and time intensive. So in the recent years, uh, we've had some advancements in machine learning models that specialize in creating vector embeddings. And uh, so we train these models that translate different types of objects, be they text or image or otherwise, into these uh, vector embeddings. And we can see here we have a couple examples for text data, word to vec glove, and BERT, transform words, sentences, and paragraphs into vector embeddings. And then for images, uh, we have examples of convolutional neural networks, um, uh, neural network models such as VGG and Inception uh, that will take you know, images and transform them. And you can extend this out into audio, et cetera. So you know, uh, real quick, kind of going into a little bit more on vectors and the representation in three-dimensional space here, we can see that I have a, um, a vector representation here that uh, has representations of red, green, and blue. Uh, so you can think of RGB as kind of the, uh, the coordinate uh, points where, where we're kind of mapping things out. So we have blue um, with its coordinates mapped to RGB. And then, you know, we have uh, Han purple uh, with its RGB coordinates as well. And now if we zoom in here, we can find the clustered items. So if we look at, at dots that are closer together, Payne's gray and then cadet, we can also see the color uh, represented by the box that pops up. These two are very, very closely related. Um, and we can expect that because they're very closely um, nested in these embeddings. If we come a little bit further away, we can see we have light slate gray. And again, if I zoom back out, we can kind of see that these clusters are, are ordered, right? So yellow, um, uh, kind of at the bottom right. Then we have the blues, uh, the reds and magentas, the, the purples, uh, and the greens. So really, you know, this is a good way of conceptualizing these vector embeddings. And, um, you know, now that, now that we have a concept of what vector embeddings are, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how they're stored and, and some use cases for them. So when you have a vector, which again you can think of as, uh, as coordinates, um, you need a way to store them, right? So these embeddings that are generated by an AI model, 
uh, contain a lot of metadata about the attributes or certain features of an object. Uh, so you need a way to store them so that you can search through them. So there are vector indexes and there are vector databases. Again, with you know indexes and databases, they give you a way to quickly and easily locate something, you know, some piece of data that you're looking for, um, typically through through queryability. So when we think about vector databases like Pinecone and Weaviate. Uh, they really uh, optimize the functionality that many businesses need in order to uh, to interact with these types of systems. So they're intentionally designed to handle um, this specific type of embedding data to offer performance, scalability, and flexibility. Now here we can see an example of, of how one might actually interact with a, a vector system. So we have uh, an application where a user comes in and, and maybe it's a, a question and answer bot. Uh, where we're searching through some, you know, some private corporate knowledge base. So the user, um, once we have uh, created the vector embeddings for all of our, our corporate knowledge data, um, we, we have a query that comes in, uh, the user inputs a query, and they, we use the same embedding model uh, to create an embedding off of that user's query. Maybe it's, you know, uh, how do I open a support ticket? Um, and then the, um, the vector database is used to search for similar vector embeddings. So it will find um, things that are very closely related, like in this example, if we ask, you know, how do we open a support ticket? Um, it will find the vector embeddings that closely relate to support or how to support, etc. cetera, um, and then it will return those. So, you know, there are a couple different uh, in differences between indexes and, and vector databases, I won't go too deep in them, you know, save to say that that databases offer much more robust solutions for things like create, read, update, and delete options, as well as, you know, various integrations with other data sources, maybe some business intelligence and ETL type tools, uh, and things like that. So now finally, what are what are vector embeddings actually used for? So we talked a little bit about recommendation systems. If you like one thing, you might like another thing because it's closely related. Um, but then there's also things like search. So text search, again, where we're looking for kind of keywords and relevance, and uh, an image search, which, you know, image search is really cool because yeah, you can feed in an image and, and find something that's very closely related. Um, maybe in the case, you know, as these evolve, we can think of movies where, like, hey, I, I really like this Wes Anderson movie, you know, the color palette, um, find me other movies that are, that are very closely related to this, obviously with products and product search as well, you can do that. Chatbots and question answering systems, maybe you have a support case system where uh, you're, you know, bringing down mean time to resolution for your support cases um, by searching through a vector store for prior cases that are closely related to your case. And then a couple other use cases like fraud detection is really cool. So again, coming back here, maybe we have a cluster where you know all of our payments uh, should be, right? So we know that all of our payments are very closely related. They should be in this cluster. And in this case, we're looking for outliers, right? So that could be potential fraud if it's further away um, from our uh, other embedding representations. So a lot of uh, things you can do here. This, this space is still, relatively uh, in the early days and, and um, evolving quite quickly. But um, yeah, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.